Hello, and thank you all for tuning in. My name is Michael Mercurio. I'm a member of the Festival Steering Committee, and I also serve on the Board of Directors of Faraday Publishing. So it's truly a joy and a privilege to welcome you tonight. I'm here with Brooke Steinhauser, Program Director for the Emily Dickinson Museum. Hello, everybody. It's really great to be here. We're so excited about this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is a program of the Tell It Slant Poetry Festival, a week-long virtual event produced by the Emily Dickinson Museum, celebrating the legacy of Emily Dickinson and fostering community by amplifying contemporary poetic voices. I hope you've had the chance to check out our full calendar of events and sign up for other sessions. We're really excited to be able to bring the festival, now in its eighth year, into a virtual format and into your homes this week, and we hope that you and yours are well. I'm sure you've been looking forward to this particular program as much as I have. Both the Tell It Slant Poetry Festival and Faraday Publishing recognize the value of active engagement with our diverse contemporary literary landscape and the necessity of representation and participation by historically underrepresented voices in every part of the conversation. This panel is a strong affirmation that Black lives and Black poetics do matter and we are grateful to our panelists for their willingness to share their knowledge, wisdom, and poetry with us tonight. During this evening's program, listeners in our webinar are encouraged to engage with the poets by offering affirmations through the Q&A and chat. We may have a few minutes at the end of the evening to address audience questions. And for those of you following along on Facebook, we encourage you to do the same through the live stream. This program will conclude by 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our host this evening, Enzo Silon Surin, who will then introduce our guest poets. Enzo is a Haitian-born poet, educator, speaker, publisher, and social advocate, and the author of When My Body Was a Clinched Fist, put out by Black Lawrence Press this past July of 2020, and two chapbooks, a Letter of Resignation, an American Libretto, which came out in 2017, and Higher Ground. He is a Penn New England celebrated new voice in poetry, the recipient of a Brother Thomas Fellowship from the Boston Foundation, and a 2020 Dennis Diderot AIR grant recipient as an artist in residence at Chateau d'Orcvo in Orcvo, France. Enzo's work gives voice to experiences that take place in what he calls broken spaces, and his poems have been featured in numerous publications and exhibits. He holds an MFA in creative writing from Lesley University and teaches creative writing and literature at Bunker Hill Community College. He is also president, director, and founder of Faraday Publishing. Enzo? Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, the Emily Dickinson Museum uh, for hosting this and tell it slant. Um, it's definitely a wonderful opportunity to be um, to be here tonight having this conversation with this with this great list of scholars, curators, uh, activists um, that you'll get a chance to, to know tonight. Uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight is uh, the purpose of this um, panel is really to have a, a conversation, um, not just about you know Black lives and Black poetics, um, as it relates to the current times, but uh, the amount of work that a lot of folks have been doing behind the scenes have continued to be, uh, continue to do behind the scenes. Um, and they're represented here in this panel tonight. And so uh, tonight I am both the moderator and a fan because uh, the folks uh, wait till you hear their work. Um, I'm familiar with their work, familiar with the, not just their poetry, but the work that they also do in the community and in the classrooms and so forth. Uh, and I know you're gonna have a really good um, opportunity to, to experience all this wonderful work that they're doing tonight. And so uh, I wanted to get started by um, really getting into the poetry. And then, so we'll get a chance to experience a number um, of different things, different themes throughout the work. But I wanted to start off with our very first uh, reader, uh, Bonita P uh, Lee Penn. Um, Bonita is a Pittsburgh poet, so shout out to Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> we represent her. She's also an editor and a curator. Uh, she is the author of the chapbook, um, Every Morning a Foot is Looking for My Neck. Now, when this book came out from Center Square Press, which I am also um, founder and editor of, 
Um, it was way before uh, our current climate, um, but her book speaks volume to the current situation. And I really wanted her to lead this, um, this reading tonight. I start off with a poem from that. So Bonita, if you please bless us with a poem from the book. Uh, thank you, Enzo. And also thank you, um, Brooke and Michael in the Emily Dickinson Museum. And I am so honored to be here with these great poets. And um, as he said, my book, Every Morning a Foot is Looking for My Neck, was um, out in 2019. And I am going to start off by reading the title poem. And the poems in this book are from the view of the Black woman. I don't speak for all Black women, but I'm sure we all can connect. So let's just start with the first one. Every morning a foot is looking for my neck. Roll porcupine tight, squeeze in between tight out of the way spaces, disappear. Told us to carry the burdens, nasty, dirty, big booty, black and racist, big hips and bitter, feminist, revolutionist, pissed poet, shadow of an evil, eyed animal, not woman enough to be loved, a wife, never a mother. One of those uppity mixed up bitches, one of them two educated motherfuckers, ignore her, screw her, throw her away, shove her in a dark corner, evict her from her own box, bury her, silence her, erase her humanity and stain exotic Porno postcards dressed in veils, hajibs, and bananas. The world yells and tells us to be a chameleon, to blend, to press ourselves into the recesses, into shadows of our own skin, to lay low, to be silent, to shrink, disappear. Thank you. Snap, right? When we talk about the voice of um, Black lives, um, often, as we're finding out with um, a lot of media these days still calling for the arrest of certain individuals as it relates to crimes against Black women. Um, and so I think when we, when we have Black lives and we talk about that, it's very important that we have um, voices of Black women leading a lot of this conversation because they continue to be marginalized um, and yet they're at the center of all this. And so it's really a good segue that I transition right now from uh, Bonito's striking poem to uh, Shauna Morgan, um, a scholar, uh, activist, um, also an educator as well. Um, and she's the author of the chapbook, Fear of Dogs and Other Animals. And the title of the book itself is um, striking um, in the same way that Bonita's um, book was striking. And so I don't wanna to explain too much about her book, um, but her life work is really committed to um, not just changing lives on the, on the page as a poet, but in terms of her scholarship as well and focusing on the effects um, that, um, that all these conditions continue to have upon black lives. Um, and being a sister from the Caribbean as well, uh, we get this, you know, this connection as well and having that, that double really uh, consciousness that exists, as I often talk about being from Haiti, allows me to experience the current climate as both a uh, black American and also as a Haitian American and having political violence and social violence really reflected in two different realms. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very great um, opportunity for us to have that voice uh, as part of this panel as well. So please, Shauna, if you can bless us with a poem from your book. Yes, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. And uh, if you will permit me, I wanna actually start with a really, really short poem um, from uh, Lucille Clifton, and then I'll share one of my short short poems. I think it's important, Enzo. I'm so glad you you mentioned that. You know, Black women and Black women poets have been you know at the fore of this conversation for for a very long time, right? 
And um, it's, it's interesting to, to think about us reading, right, at this particular festival, um, when uh, Elizabeth Alexander eulogized um, or wrote an obituary for, for Lucille Clifton, whose poem I'll open with, she said that um, to Dickinson's intense compression, Clifton adds an explicit historical consciousness, right? And um, I think all of our work is in, is in that tradition. Um, so Lucille Clifton's The News, everything changes. The old songs click like light bulbs going off. The faces of men dying scar the air. The moon becomes the mountain. Who would have thought, who would believe dead things could stumble back and kill us? And I'll share um, my poem, Live Oak from Fear of Dogs and Other Animals. My roots run deep down into the soil watered by the salt spray born by my foremothers on whose limbs little white boys climbed and hung their swings. These heavy boughs, thick and ligneous, spreading wide and low enough for a man to lean, rest his back and hide behind the curtain of Spanish moss, soft enough for the wind to murmur, tell truths that come quietly, sometimes in wispy hushes. His heritage runs deep too, bloody taproot, a bourbon barrel ablaze, a beam in a dark cabin, a boy child without a likeness, a resurrection fern, fronds wrapped and waiting. I'm so glad you decided to um, to open up with um, the ancestors, right? Um, because a lot of this groundwork, as you mentioned, has been done. Um, and, and what we're really doing is continuing this tradition of, of, of telling our stories. I think now we have a much bigger audience that's listening to it. Um, so thank you for sharing uh, Clifton's work. Uh, she continues to be still one of the favorite poets that I teach every single semester. Um, um, as a way of bringing voices forward. So um, so next poet that I wanna read um, is Lisa Pegram. Uh, Lisa is a writer, educator, art uh, integration specialist and a literary publicist. Um, and Lisa's coming to us from Curacao. Um, she's a DC, uh, DC native, but current coming from us, you know, she's in the Caribbean now. And so, um, and so what I wanted to, Lisa, before you share the poems that you're going to share, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to, to what Shauna would just mention about, you know, that tradition of, of the voices, right? And, and the tradition of trying to get um, the idea of compression, right? Um, within the poet's work um, and within your own work, because there's a lot of compression in your work as well, which is also part of the thing that wasn't in the bio as much as the mindfulness, right, that you practice. Um, if you can talk a little bit about that too, the role of that in Black um, poetics, mindfulness as well, and how that affects your writing. And then maybe you can share one of your beautiful poems with us as well after that. Sure, thank you, Enzo. I'm so happy to be here with everyone. And thank you, Emily Dickinson Museum for, for having us all together in this space. Um, and I think, you make a really good point, Enzo. I, I practice um, mindfulness as sort of a lifestyle, lifestyle choice. And I've come to find, and I think particularly given the current circumstances that the juxtaposition of that mindfulness practice and my, create, my creative practice has been what has really gotten me through this really tempestuous period. So. I would say that now more than ever, the mindfulness practice has made its way into my writing before it made the way for my writing. And now it's actually making its way into my writing. So I wouldn't necessarily write about mindfulness before, but just as I've just been receiving the words that have come to me in response to the current, um, well, the current many situations, I'm finding that the mindfulness is, is making its way into the work. So I'll, I'll read this poem, which is one that sort of came to me in a flash. 
and now, unfortunately, I can't even keep track as to which um, nightmare I was watching on the news when this one came. Um, but it was very late at night and maybe even early in the morning. And it's called Grieve. Yes, grieve. Yes, mourn. Yes, rage. Yes, howl. Yes, storm. Yes, cry. Yes, sigh. Yes, curse. Yes, refuse. Yes, demand. Yes, tend the fire. Yes, stand. Yes. But also, turn inward, breathe, hydrate, recharge, meditate, exfoliate, breathe, move, sweat, soak, crack a joke, laugh, pray, stretch, breathe, eat whole foods, grab the hot sauce, walk barefoot in nature, put your hands in some soil, sit on the stoop or porch, make love, make art, get fly, praise the mirror, sleep, breathe, get daily sunlight, limit screen time, fellowship, call an elder, call someone who calls you baby, call the ancestors, oil your scalp, oil your skin, lift your head. We cannot fight or claim victory if we surrender our health, our joy, our light, Self-care is serious collective business, so breathe, close the door, open the windows, put the needle on the record, play the music loud, write it to the source, our song, our dance, our swag, our rhythm, our bass, our groove, our roots, our frequency. After all this time, it remains elusive. It remains untouched. Go there, rest in the swell of its bosom, rock in the cradle of its hips, bask in its vibration, that it may raise yours, breathe. Mm. Ooh, <laughs> made me take a breath, right? Um, and I think one of the great things about um, the poem that, that you read is the idea of black lives, right? Um, folks always see black lives in context of death, right? So when we say black lives matter, it's like, oh, save us from dying. Uh, where at the heart of your poem is we just want to breathe. We want to live. We want to be free. We want to make love. We want to do all sorts of things, right? And that these constant interruptions um, that prevent us from, you know, from doing such things. And so I appreciate that poem even more now, I think, as I try to remind myself, you know, to take these deep breaths, to reach out to people, to touch, you know, uh, I know it's kind of tough now with the pandemic to, you know, to reach out to folks and, and see them face to face. But the idea that, you know, we have to be constantly mindful, but when the mind is occupied with struggle, it's very hard to remember to take a breath. Um, and so thank you for that, Lisa. Um, before uh, we get to um, Brother Medina's uh, work, um, I'm gonna read a poem from, from my current collection, One Body Was a Clenched Fist. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do tonight was really step back and allow uh, these wonderful folks to just showcase their work um, and share, to share their thoughts. But I do wanna talk about when we talk about Black Lives Mattering um, and Black Poetics, uh, the idea of mental health as well, which is the focus of my book. Um, and it's about what happens when trauma um, finds itself um, festering for so many years within a young body and what happens to that. Um, and I think what the poems that I've been read so far uh, sort of made me choose a particular piece here that talks about choice in life. Um, and so I'll be reading a poem titled Damnified Field Theory uh, from the book. Don't paint yourself into a corner would imply one has a choice, a say. In the selection, the brush, paint, and the room. Corners to edge one's body's sharp elbows and knees into. A choice is not a choice if one does not have a say in the options. If we did, we would be gods. But no matter, ardent vow or ache for calling one another God, we were not. What we were taught, it was wrong. I recall playmates who made a corner their epistle. 
and grapple with knowledge of survival not being in the strength of an arm or in the thickness of clothes, but in how often one succumbed to the ruse of believing heaven was too far up and out of reach, that one did not deserve it. We were taught all corners were bad places where idle dust or idle things collected dust. Yet New York City was filled with such many such rooms. Could it be our demise was planned and choices we made not choices but decisions and selections made were a consequence of not being ones to follow the options? A room with such corners isn't a city, isn't a choice. When all signs point to hell, just a few blocks away in every direction. When we talk about spaces, we also have to talk about the bodies that occupy those spaces as well. And I think one of the underscore conversations that we have um, um, not had in public, but we certainly have within amongst this group here, but also in, in private, you know, private conversations is uh, we always look for the person that's that's screaming with their, you know, with their hair on fire, you know, for lack of a better metaphor, that's the person that needs help. But yet some folks are quietly suffering as a result of the trauma that they experience. And so when we talk about, you know, choices, uh, or why didn't they make a better choice? Um, the book really pushes the point that no matter what choice you make, everybody dies at some point. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, do they die internally or they die externally, right, for us to view. And so, um, and I think it's a really good segue as well to go right into, um, you know, Brother Medina's work. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction because this brother is an accomplished poet, scholar. Um, and one of the things I did want to highlight, right, that I've always wanted to share is the fact that Tony Medina is a rare poet in the sense that he also writes for the youngins. <laughs> now, when I grew up, every poet that I knew, almost every poet had what I call the adult album, and then they had an album for the kids, right? And so uh, Langston, uh, that was a tradition, right? And so I think we fell away from that a little bit, right? Um, I'm not sure why fully, but I appreciate the fact that you're not just having these conversations with, uh, with adults, that you're having them with kids. And to have your books be celebrated and to, to just listen to kids comment about how much your book has impacted them um, is one of the reasons why I said, no, you definitely have to be on this panel tonight because um, it is a matter of endorsing um, a much greater conversation, I think. And so, um, so besides the scholarship and being an educator and so forth, I do hope that um, folks get more of a, um, glimmer into all the other things that you dealt with, especially for the young people as well. And so um, I'm not sure which poem you're going to share, because, <laughs> uh, but I'm wondering, I mean, at some point, and I'm hoping that you will share some of those work as well, but I'll just let you share your poetry with the folks right now. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Enzo. I want to thank uh, Michael and Brooke for having me. And I want, I'm just glad to be here with Benita and Lisa and uh, Shauna, who's one of my colleagues at Howard University. This one is about um, a brother who was killed by the police in Sacramento in, in, his, in his grandmother's backyard. It's for Stefan Clark, it's called Stefan Clark. And it begins with this, this quote from Harriet Ann Jacobs. There are wrongs which even the grave does not bury. Stefan Clark. There'll be time enough for blood blooming petals peeled from overfed flesh. A late night stroll patrolling the petunias in grandma's garden. No need for patios light haloed by flies, spider webs and moths flailing away as if drowning in midair. Oh, who could tell in all that dark grass shifting beneath, beneath flat feet. Who could tell the silhouette in the dark framed by starlight in distant windows? Who could tell a body from a target study at night? There'll be time enough for blood blooming petals pierced with lead fed flesh. The sin in the garden of breathing of being black in all that black 
What falls is not paradise, but 12 bullet shells, the rest buried in the back, dislodged out the chest, blooming petals of blood in the garden, in the garden of no more breathing, of blackness leaving. Thank you so much for that. Now, this is the part where, you know, folks can just chime in if you feel like you have something to follow up. Um, your work speaks to that. Because um, part of this is I really wanted this to be a conversation, right? A dialogue of both uh, poetry and, and thought as well. And so um, that particular poem, Brother I mean, and in, in, in just listening to the idea of being safe, right? In one's grandmother's backyard. Um, but not safe, <laughs> you know? Um, that's the striking part about this, when folks say, well, what was the person doing, right? Um, and when we have Breonna Taylor, <laughs> we say, well, what was this person doing? And we get all these conversations about what was this person doing? Um, maybe they were doing something wrong. I said, well, you're in your own house or in your grandmother's house, right? Or you're just minding your own business. Um, one of the stories I, I shared, um, right around the time uh, Shauna's book came out was that I was meditating on the very last poem she has in the book. And the book had to do with, you know, uh, the particular poem um, had to do with the idea that, you know, police are gonna do what they're gonna do, you're not really sure. And I was on my way to work, um, you know, all dressed up in, cause I get excited when I go to teach, you know, all dressed up, you know, feeling professor-like uh, as I was crossing the street, you know, police car crossed the, the median. <laughs> And immediately I knew, <laughs> right? My shoulders, you know, slashed down, my hands visible. Uh, and they said, well, somebody got robbed at the train station. And so, and you kind of fit the description. And I said, you know, I'm heading towards the train station, right? Um, and I said, well, what was the description like? And I said, well, never mind. He says, I'm really sorry. Like very apologetic, right? And so, and then I thought, what are the chances that that morning I was working on the manuscript, you know, and getting this book out into the world. And yet I was accosted with, you know, with, with police and fitting that description, right? And so, and the reason why I share this story is because I struggle with, and I'm wondering if you guys can speak to this as well. Um, and then, you know, share a poem too. What part of us, as we sit down to write, often says, I just want to write a regular poem. I'm, and I don't know what regular means, right? I just want to write a regular poem. Like, I don't want all my poems to be about poems of struggle, but yet the shift, you know, your life, no matter what you do, you know, tenured professor of English, and you still fit the description. And so I kind of want to, if you could share with the folks um, what process you go through in saying, I'm going to write this poem, but maybe I don't really want to write this poem. Like, do you ever feel that way? And what does that mean to you as an artist to be able to have those thoughts? I, this is something I think about all the time. And um, I feel I feel compelled to re read that that last poem in the in the collection at some point. Uh, this evening, but I, I think about this all the time because for me, I am a, a very sort of sensory engaged person, right? And so I'm always very aware of smells and scents in my space and and nature. You know, I love to get into the earth and the ground, and and often, right? My my art, my work comes out of that space. You know, you'll see me engage nature constantly, or my poems are tend to be very sensory, but within that, right, I, the struggle is embedded in the creation of that art, regardless of if I am, you know, writing about growing something in the garden, right, or writing about an, an encounter my nine-year-old has with the police. You know, I think the struggle is at times embedded in the work um, in implicit ways. And then at times it's very confessional, right? Because the moment or the, 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 the feeling, the, the, the tension, the pain calls for that. And so I, you know, I think that for, for me at least, I still try to, there are times when the work 
calls for something very raw and explicit, you know, and then there are times when it is very much connected to the landscape and how I'm interacting with the landscape, for example. And I'll, I'll share uh, this, this poem. I um, lived in Central Virginia for, for some time and uh, I hadn't lived anywhere beyond the Caribbean Basin before I, I got there. And uh, this poem is a, from a series of poems called The Valley Poems. This valley, strange things, there are some things I will never understand about this place. The familiar smell of dinner being cooked on a wood fire. This I know. The way you can gaze up a hillside and see every tree move. This I know. How a bird takes flight and makes circles above dead cattle. This I know. How a river sometimes swells to a thunder, churning up a muddy wash. This I know. What I do not know is the value of a magnolia. It's stiff but smooth white petals. I do not know how a blossom so broad can burst from a tree or how a tree so grand can bloom flowers and men. And so this, this, you know, this, this poem very much, you know, is sort of, I, I feel when I read it immersed in the landscape, but this landscape is also very much colored with murder, lynching, blood, and a history of that, right? And so um, the, I, I know the poem you were referring to is, it goes in a different direction. It's very raw, it's very explicit. Um, uh, but, I, but I guess I, you know, the struggle is embedded in all of that. Thank you. With, with, um, that was a beautiful poem. With me, um, I mean, I, I talked about this the other day, I think on, on Facebook or something. I, I mentioned how we are burdened as writers of color, black, brown, what have you, with having to bear witness, as James Baldwin would put it, and deal with <laughs> our oppression. And we also champion you know, other forms of oppression all over the world and stuff like that. So in that vein, you know, you know, from from the first poet on down, like you know, you look at people like Langston Hughes and um, Lucille Clifton, who also wrote for children, you know, and Baraka and stuff like that. Um, you just can't, uh, you just can't write uh, with the privilege of not having to deal <laughs> with, um, you know, racism. Uh, capitalist oppression and, and these type of things. So it's incredible that, 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 that we survive through it. But if you look at all of black poetry, you know, it's a, it's a, it tells you the whole history of black people and the movement of black you know, folks in the globe all over the place. So no matter how you, you twist and turn, you have to confront the reality of the day. You know, some poets, you know, maybe some white poets would have the privilege of writing about nature and stuff like that. But even when we write about nature, you know, there's a tree there and somebody's hanging from that mofo, you know what I'm saying? So with that in mind, I'll read this piece um, that, pay, that basically kind of deals with uh, the double pandemic we find ourselves, you know, um, stuck in. And it first appeared in Ishmael Reed's, um, in um, Tennessee Reed's Conch Magazine online. So you can find it online with Conch, Kale, and CH and, 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 and Shauna and Enzo knows that's a Caribbean thing, cons, right? So this will be in my book that's coming out in October called Death with Occasional Smiling. This is called In Venice, Dolphins Swim the Canals. In Venice, dolphins swim the canals as LA skies are crystal ball clear, predicting the coming of the cicadas in DC's cherry blossoms opening early like parasol debutante umbrellas. The streets are empty. Everyone is sheltered in as a virus rages like Ralph Ellison, invisible to the naked eye, while a naked ape, an orange idiot, sans the savant, is babbling about it being a hoax, a hoax, it's all a hoax, telling us from the White, White House don't believe your lying eyes as refrigerated trucks in Brooklyn stockpile bodies and freezers like popsicles 
This agent orange menace is a virus unto himself as racism is, as stupidity is in a country where Confederate statues are more visible than common sense. A virus named after a cheap piss water beer, this menace barks China, 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 as if repulsed by his wife's vagina. At a press conference, he bogarts the mic from the experts who know more about science than he knows about stealing, telling us hydroxychloroquine, malaria pills are good as tic tacs at fighting bad breath. He should know. And if that doesn't work, you could spray down your tongue with Lysol or belt back some Clorox to crank your box. In Venice, dolphins swim the canals free of debris, while here black joggers are hunted by fathers and sons in a rite of passage Jim Crow outdoor trailer trash parlor game as Amy or Karen or Becky with the bad brain scream hysterically into cell phones at 9-11. At 911, operators in their worst Stanislavski method acting like the black birder is a mockingbird while an essential worker EMT cannot get in any PPE. Instead, she got eight bullets into her bone tired sleeping body in a 21 gun salute to T.S. Eliot with a side of side eye because May is the cruelest month, especially during a lockdown where racism and hate are never quarantined, yet a black man remains a stepping stool for a white man's knee who drummed out Colin Kaepernick as if flagged as if a flag takes precedence over a black life. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I was thinking when Lisa was talking about she writes from mindfulness hmm. and how I attempt to write that way at times but it always turns into a warrior's chant. Um, it's like we're always writing from mourning. We're always grieving. You know, it's always the struggle. And sometimes it's very exhausting to have to write that way. But as some people protest out in the trenches, the poets are here writing about that. And so we also struggle and it's just what we do. And I tell people that I don't write love poems. Other people do that. This is what I write. And I try to write a chant after I'm Eric Gardner, the, you know, the I can't breathe. And I thought I would write something, you know, like a chant, like to encourage people to, to breathe or something. And it just, I mean, it kind of worked. Mindfulness kind of didn't. It still had a little bite to it. But um, I also wrote it after um, India Ari song, Breathe. And so the title of it is called, It's So All Overwhelming. Because God knows we carry burdens, appendages to our shoulders, to our backs. It's a wonder we even walk upright. As we pace through this unrighteous mess, built brick by sweat, sweat by blood. By the strength of our backs, we breathe, we breathe in honor of our ancestors, breathe. And we gather in circled hips, beats of hand fans move the air where land and sea meet, where the waves adorn our ankles. And we speak in tongues, only bones on ocean floors understand. In tongues that whisper, then shout out in revival. We honor our ancestors. We continue to breathe, breathe. You know, Bonita, you said you don't write love poems, but other people do. And I just wanted to interject, just jump in there for a quick minute <laughs> um, because your entire collection is a love poem mm -hmm. because um, the title poem to your collection, right? Every morning a foot is looking for my neck. That was a love letter that was sent into the future to, to Greg Floyd. Cause that's exactly what I looked and I said, here it is, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, and we've talked about this too, you being um, a parent as well, right? Affects your, your poetics. And so 
here's a letter that you wrote and it was, and we got to watch this on national television um, that what we were saying is not, we're not being metaphorical in a lot of ways. <laughs> right. Like, you know, you know, um, Tony's book, you know, death was occasional smile. That's not being metaphorical. It's just that there's all these interruptions, right? Um, you wake up in the morning and you get dressed, but what is on your mind, right? Um, there's, it's a whole different process. And what you're smiling at, <laughs> right? It's kind of like, you're too happy, right? There's actually a poem that, um, that that's part of a new collection I'm working, uh, I'm working on. And it, and it sort of like really chronicles the lives of folks and how it's interrupted. Um, like, what are you smiling at as if your smile is, is to be interrogated? Um, and it's not just the police, right? And it's not just, um, I think I've been waiting a while to have this conversation about the quote unquote Karens, right? Um, because I would rather use the folks real names because they're real people. And I want folks who know them <laughs> to hold them accountable, right? Um, it's funny, some family members have come out and say, yeah, we always knew this person was racist and we don't condone it. We don't want anything to do with that, right? That's the kind of ac accountability that we're looking for versus you know, a name that sort of summarizes. But, but I do think in, in, it is important to point out that what you do the effort that you do to wake up every day and to say to yourself, I'm actually going to write about this, right? Um, and I think, I forget what, how, you, how you framed it, um, uh, Tony, in, in terms of uh, that double, what was the term that you used? Um, to try to explain like what it's... Oh, can you say that again? Because your mic was, was muted before. The double pandemic of the double race. pandemic, right? It's oh, wow. like you wake up and you're saying to yourself, "What am I going to face today?" Right? Do I worry about Corona or everything else that's directed at me? And then thirdly, mindfulness, right? <laughs> Breathe. Let me grab some lunch. Let me, you know, hug some people. Let me reach out to those folks. And um, it is tough to to live in that. And I think writing about it is love. It's love. And so that's why I wanted to, and then I'll step back out. I no, just wanted uh, to point actually, that out. You know what's interesting? Um, a number of us on this panel are Caribbean, right? And so what the Caribbean is like paradise, right? And then there's, mm. you know, colonialism comes and slavery comes and capitalism comes and neocolonialism. So you have that paradise lost dynamic. So where we come from, like, like Lisa is right now, it's such a beautiful should be a beautiful, serene place where we can have that mindfulness and, and feed our soul and, and be one with the um, the land and the sea and all that stuff, the sand and sea. Um, but we got that that oppression on us, right? So when you you hear the music, right? You hear Caribbean music, particularly like salsa and stuff like that. It's like even when they deal with oppression, that black joy emanates <laughs> from the music, you know. And it you reminded me. Of what we talked about yesterday about black joy like so we don't just write about oppression and stuff like that and and in the sad stuff even in the midst of writing about these difficult um uh times and moments and where we bear witness and we bear our soul we still talking about you know the beauty and we even in that there's music you know there's that blues and that duende and all that stuff i think that's a really interesting um interesting point because so often people want to separate um, black joy from black suffering. And I find that really interesting because so often you hear people marvel at, at how we are able to maintain our joy, the bottomlessness of our joy, how we are the most resilient people because in the face of all of this tribulation, we've been able to maintain the joy and my position is that we have not been able to maintain the joy. It's what Tony is saying. The joy is what we are, right? So you, you are not impressed by, by the moon shining because the moon could be going through a really hard time, but the moon is going to shine because that's what the moon does, right? So it, 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 these things are not mutually exclusive. 
um, that is part of the miracle, I think, that we could experience such profound joy and such profound suffering simultaneously and not have one compromise the other. Um, and since everyone is talking about landscape and nature pieces, and then I had this nature poem I was gonna read, but then Benita brought in this really wonderful point about trying to get to the mindfulness, but that this warrior, warrior comes out. I think that's also an important point to make about the mindfulness, right? That the mindfulness is not the antidote or the anesthesia to the rage, right? So we think the rage is so toxic that we better go somewhere and breathe or meditate. And this is true, right? That we should, we, that we should have these techniques um, to address the stress that comes from it, but there is a place for the rage. And I think that is part of the, the mindful process also. And I think the writing for me is the place where I can put it. Yeah. Right? So, so that I can fully be in it. Like, I'm not gonna go out and straight, like go, you know, in Zynga warrior princess on them, literally, but I will do it on the page, right? Like that's the place. And that is an act of mindfulness for me me acknowledging the fact that I feel that rage and not being in that position of, of on the page, I'm not worried about who thinks I'm an angry black woman, what they care about the fact that I have this rage, that I should not be expressing it because we're constantly told that we're not supposed to allow that rage to exist in its fullness. And I think that is anti-mindfulness, right? Um, so instead of reading um, one nature poem, I'm gonna read another one that was inspired by Benita bringing that point up. Although I will say that they are both inspired by trees. I do think that as a black people across the diaspora, we have a very interesting relationship with trees. Shauna really spoke really beautifully to that, right? That we see, you see the tree and you recognize its place in nature, but there is so much heavy history that blooms from trees for us that it's, for me, it is, it is rare that I see a tree and don't also see a person in some way, shape, or form. Um, so this poem is called Kibrahacha. It's named after um, Curacao's local native tree. I love this tree because Kibrahacha translates to ax breaker, which means that the trunk of the tree is so strong that it will break an ax. So if you try to chop it down, it will, it will break the ax is the lore, right? And so when I first saw the tree, I was like, oh, that's a black woman, <laughs> like, right? Like, so, so it, it, it may not be that the ax itself may make impact, but the idea is, yep, nope, but we're still, nope, we're still here. We're still here. So every time I see that tree, that's what I think of. So this poem is called Kibrahacha. Folks know me best as Aquarius, water bearer that pours all the namaste, om shanti to soothe and cleanse a weary soul. But don't get it twisted. Even a sponge has a saturation point. My rising sign is Leo. These locks are both antenna for positive energy and the most fiery of mames. I be the granddaughter of Margaret and her daughter named after her, Margaret meaning pearl, a gem born from a grain of sand that struggles and grinds to make the world its oyster. Our matriarch executed a whole revolution around a table set for 12 with crystal, silver, and china, all that cut deep when sharpened or broken. I be the daughter of Raymond, whose name means wise protector or mighty, whose fist is the size of a lion's paw, whose horns bear the mark of Taurus and whose personal motto is, I play for keeps. I be the echo of Fannie Lou, Tony and Angela, Sun Tzu and Tula taught me. I don't choose between Malcolm and Martin. I keep the peace, but if you look for me, you will find me. A monk is a sage, but so is a warrior. Beware the crouching tiger and the hidden dragon. I be the Kibrahacha, the tree whose bark breaks axes and the backs that swing them. I be the queen of the chessboard, the only piece that moves any way she chooses. The same match I use to light copal may also burn your house down. I am Palo Santo, my power not extinguished but unleashed by the flame. I don't run from smoke, I bathe in it. I be Aquarius, water barrow, but my rising sign is Leo 
born of fire. And contrary to popular belief, Aquarius is an air sign. So I be the fire and the air that makes it rage. I be not the sea, but the breath beneath the moon's call that bids it move. I like taking, I need, you know, I'm, I just want to jump right now, right? The energy is just flowing through all these pieces. And I think, I mean, a lot of this conversation about nature, you know, um, starts, starts, starts me thinking about, you know, nature and what folks are considered to be natural, right? Um, and when we talk about grief and we talk about, you know, the struggle and everything else, as you mentioned, uh, folks were like, well, it's naturally part of your story right um and then like well we're from different places right and so the natural setting for which you know the joy comes out of is very different <laughs> from where we come from right and so as part of that um and i love how you know brahmadina you mentioned that the the roots of the caribbean right having that that um that connection means that we get to celebrate things in a very different way um you know being poor doesn't mean uh no lack of joy <laughs> you know it was just like you know um having that that sense of and and i think i've i've come to learn that um at least from what i know it is an american construct at least for me because in caribbean i had i had less than what most folks have here and they're less happy than you know than we were in having less right and i think it is that sort of um that symbiotic relationship with your environment right and i realize there's something else that's contributing to the lack of joy and i realize a lot of it is these social constructs and political constructs right um when we get into you know black poetics in fact one of the things i you know when i sat down with michael i said you know well what would this panel be about because i know there's a lot of panels talking about you know black lives matter and black poetics and i said i wanted us to have a conversation that um, that goes a little bit deeper than just, um, you know, representation, right? The the lingo and the, the, the you know, we know the buzzwords, right? Um, and I, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that you guys are sharing what you're sharing because I believe this is what we need to be having a conversation about. The idea that there's not one particular narrative, but at the same time, there is something that weaves all of it together. That, that brings us together. And, and I love the tree metaphor. Um, and sort of remind, and I don't have the poem here with me, but um, every time I talk with Lisa, she helps me figure out what I've written, right? So I write it, not knowing why I wrote it, and then she'll talk to me about something. And then all of a sudden I realize, oh, that's what it meant. And because um, last summer my neighbors were um, trimming the trees out back. And, and I got to stand by the window and watch the whole process and, you know, them cutting limb by limb and so forth. And at some point I asked, why was this being cut? Was the tree diseased or anything? And it was, they were just doing it for Vista. They wanted a view, <laughs> right? And I thought that tree, I mean, was giant, tall, had been around. And I said, that tree had seen so many winters, had seen so many different things. And here it is that someone is chopping it down for a view. Mm -hmm. And I thought, could that be a metaphor for a lot of what, what's happening now too? And I realized, you know, the current state of politics is to debunk, you know, all these wonderful things that we've accomplished and put these crazy narratives into place, which is why I wrote a letter of resignation, right? Um, back in 2000 you know, 17 and self-published it because someone got elected and that person was changing the narrative of the country. And a lot of folks say, don't worry, no one is really going to buy that. But here we are, right? Four years later and folks are spewing the same sort of thing. And I think having this, this really good conversation about the nature of what we do um, and the natural world, whatever we call that, right? Uh, whatever it means to you, I think is really important. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll say, and I'll let somebody else jump in, is the idea that nature belongs to um, a particular class of people, a particular race. And um, and I had a conversation with a friend about these books that I'm reading about. You know, this 
there was an article that was like, black people are going back to nature, they're reclaiming nature. I said, we never left nature. <laughs> and so I pointed the narrative and I said, a slave does not get from North Carolina to Canada by foot without being comfortable with nature, <laughs> without understanding nature, right? Like to go, yeah, what's driving this person, right? And then you have guides, right? Lewis and Clark, <laughs> right? And so all of a sudden we're saying like, black and brown people have been part of nature. We are nature, right? In that sort of way. And we're being used as guides, but yet who claims it, right? Who possesses it? And I think when we talk about this aesthetic about reclaiming something, um, it's why I wrote that letter of resignation because I said, I'm, I'm tired of that narrative that I'm not gonna try to reclaim anything that already belonged to me. That's like taking money out of one pocket and you owe me, right? I was like, this belongs to me. Um, and so how do we go forward though, right, with this? Because it's stronger now, right? And the, the opposition is strong and there's still that narrative and now it's a public sort of forum. Um, how do we respond to that as, you know, as poets, um, as black folks working, not just as as, as, but as educators as well, right? As curators. And so not just on the page, like how do we respond to that? Because I know you guys do a lot of work in the community as well. And you have a lot of conversations that don't show up and on many people's radars. And so how are you handling those types of conversations about- I think about a lot of stuff because um, when you talk about the tree being chopped down for a view, yeah. that's Joni Mitchell talking about they paved paradise to put up a parking lot. Yeah. Are you talking about, you know, how we deal with our oppression and joy and stuff like that? That's Nikki Giovanni, Nikki Rosa. That's Lucille Clifton, Good Times and stuff like that, you know. But, you know, we, we go for it because, we, you know, we're like Langston Hughes. You know, I'm still here. You know, we're still here. And we just, that's part of reality for us to trudge on. And it's so necessary for us to do to do this work to tell these stories. I mean, you mentioned Lewis and Clark, right? But a lot of people don't know about York, the enslaved man, without whom Lewis and Clark would never have found their way, right? Frank X. Walker has talked a book about that, yeah. Right. And I and and the, the point about poetics, right? So we are we're doing this work, right, of writing the poetry, of, of telling these stories. But this question of poetics, I think, is really, is really interesting. Certainly you know, our teaching, our writing, our community activism, you know, the, 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 the scholar Robin D.G. Kelly talks about um, freedom in, in his book, Freedom Dreams, right? He talks about poetry as, um, you know, thinking about liberation and resistance in the way that we, you know, engage and think about poetry. He, he thinks the practice of poetry rather is a good model Right, and he pulls this from Cesaire, right, for freedom, right? If we can imagine, right, something and envision something different, um, if we can create, right, the, the act of writing and creating something, you know, freedom can become a kind of poetics, right? And it's so, it's so interesting because you know, when you, when you talk about black folk and nature, you know, that you say we've never left nature, but, but nature has system, systematically been taken away from us, right? Um, uh, you know, what capitalism has done to, to neighborhoods. One of the things that I think about as I'm, as I'm thinking about Kelly's freedom dreams, you know, and, and touching the earth and nature, you know, folks who are incarcerated, for example, what happens in a space like that, right? When you are so confined, so constricted, you know, and I just, you know, I, even in that moment, even in that space, right, we, we still endure and we still create, right? We still, we have poets, right, who, who uh, have done that. Um, and I'm gonna, if you, permit me, I'm gonna just read this short poem, uh, Needlework, uh, and it's dedicated to women who were imprisoned at uh, Parchment Farm. And uh, a lot of the, you mentioned activism, a lot of the activist work that poets are doing right now are tied to the carceral system, right? Uh, poetry is a kind of liberating practice for people who are incarcerated. Uh, but this, this poem is dedicated to women who were imprisoned at Parchment Farm and it has an epigraph. I went in search of the secret 
of what is fed that muzzled and often mutilated but vibrant creative spirit that the black woman has inherited and that pops out in wild and unlikely places to this day. And that's Alice Walker. Needlework. Before this place, me and mama and her sisters would sit around a mound of soft cotton, patches of every kind, stitching together our story. Every woman would sew and tell, sew and tell her piece until it needled up with another part of the truth. And here we sit in a rectangle of rows, a room of humming singers, the song louder than our voices without Mary Carter blues. I prefer it to the night noises vibrating from this dark block. Wrapped in plain cloth, I tug and tear, tug and tear at the seams, undo the hems into jagged edges and zigzag thread, a string of white coiled around my thumb, a finger spool. They tell us to make invisible lines, but everything I see moves like water, curves into running or whip stitch. I never made my mark except on a piece of fabric. Sometimes I make a pattern that trails far beyond this place. I hum and sing myself miles away from this square, sit in a circle of free women, feel how to shape a story and a life. <clears throat> this is sort of what I tell my students too, right? Is, is that we can use this this practice in my creative writing classes, when you create something, when you write a poem, when you are imagining something, let's put this into practice too in our activism, right? To imagine something different, another world, you know, another possibility for Black life. I, I, I am finding that the conversations that I am having are around encouraging people to turn inward. So I think activism is a highly subjective and personal road and you have to choose your lane. And I don't mean that in terms of like know your place, but you have to focus your talents based on the goals that you're trying to meet. So um, I find that these conversations now are so often turned outward, right? So there is this, whatever anybody is calling it now, the great reckoning, the great unveiling, the great moment where all of a sudden kind of larger society is recognizing um, the magnitude of the trauma and the tragedy that is happening as far as Black the, the history of Black lives in our country. And that's a wonderful thing that it's happening in the way that it is. But I think that we also have to be very careful about how outward our conversations as Black artists are because we are the ones, we are the scribes. We're the ones who record the history. We are the ones who are sitting in the moment. So if all of our conversation is turned outward to catch other people up, which is what I find as a Black scholar, I am, I'm getting, my inbox is full like, wow, is this what you were talking about all the time? Give me the book list. What am I supposed to read? How am I supposed to catch up? And I, I do think that there is a high level of earnestness in that. But I think it's, it's very dangerous also because we're supposed to be keeping time, right? So if we are constantly turned outward, who's keeping time? And so the, the conversations that I'm having with students, the conversations I'm having with colleagues are about that gentle reminder. And that's where the mindfulness takes place, right? It's not just about light a candle and some incense. It's about, but are you checking in with yourself about how you're feeling and how you're feeling about what's going on and how that's collected to the, connected to the collective experience? For me, I'm wondering if you can speak a little to that as well, because um, I think we've had you know, different conversations about similar things, right? About um, what do you do with that work, right? Um, how do you balance? How do you find that balance, right? If if there is such a thing as balance. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking about that while um, Shauna and Lisa and Tony were talking, and how I find balance 
I, I really start reading. Um, I've read um, Christina Sharp's In the Wake on Blackness and Being. And it takes me, it, it, things that I didn't know about the, the aftermath of enslavement. You know, that's what we're living right now. And so we just, and then talk about the door of no return. How can you return? And our link to water, to the ocean as black people. And those things, those things calm me down. I mean, I write, I write poems about not, it's not, I can't say it's futuristic, but it's things that we have been told about our ancestors. And some people may think that when I'm talking about um, we can bend metal, it's, I'm not really talking about, you know, physically doing that, but, but, we, but we have the strength. That's why we've gone through so much. And I do have a poem here that speaks of that. And it's, it's a connection to the water, it's connection to the earth. It's a connection to what our ancestors, we have been told, what is told in our DNA. Because if you listen to your inner self, your ancestors are speaking to you, but it's like, it's really hard if you don't listen, if you're not in that place to listen. So that's how I really call myself by, um, by reading that book and also the Black Imagination book by Natasha Morin. I've been reading that and these things like take me out of the out of the war when I'm still in the war, but I'm just thinking from a different point of view. And I find I just find it like comforting. You know, I mean it may sound a little crazy, but but it really sounds comforting to me, you know. And I, you know, that's how I do it. I mean, I do have a poem here if you want me to read it. It's called, um, well, it's, the title is a line after um, Amir Baraka. It burns the thing inside and that thing screams. We are those whose bodies are shields, whose bodies are documentation, whose bodies are shields able to bend metal bars, whose bodies are shields able to deflect bullets, silver and the gold, lead and the buckshot. We are those who fly above clouds, hurricanes and bullshit. We are those who practice respectfully, cleanse our bodies with herbs, petals, earth mother's flesh, earth mother's blood. Purification in orange and bright pinks and yellows and green breaths and releases silent sound waves. Always the drums, always the drums. Tongues, languages of Sankofa beneath the belly, back of the throat, thip, tip of the tongues. We are those ears always hearing drums. We are those feet pull up from ground, walks on air, climb plateaus, mountain tops, tree tops. We are those bodies ride waves like roller skates, like walking, skipping on water. We live here not knowing how great we are spiritually, what our ancestors planted inside us. We are our ancestors' creations. We are who our ancestors said we are, we are, we are, we are. Thank you so much, Mita. Um, wow. I feel like we can be here all night, <laughs> but um, I'm going to transition a little bit because we have about 20 minutes left, right? And I know there's some eager folks. The Q&A side is like blowing up. Um, and I would like to, you know, some of the folks to, to have a chance to ask some questions. Um, but before I do that, I would like each panelist to tell folks where, what they're working on right now, and also where folks can grab their books. <laughs> Go ahead, Medina. Uh, wherever books are sold, you can get my books. I am working on some stuff, trying to get some stuff. I got a book coming out in October called Death with Occasional Smiling. And maybe something with Enzo in the near distant future. 
That's it. <laughs> All right. Who else? Well, my book can be found on Central Square Press. And I am working on a new book. I don't have a title yet, but I do have loads of poems I'm working on. So. Right. Okay, I'll go next. Um, I am working on my next volume of poetry with Enzo, um, entitled Kibrahacha, named after that tree that I told you all about. Um, and then the big project that I've been working on that is, is, is coming around the mountain when she comes is a family memoir that is a narrative cookbook. So it's telling the story of my family or the women in my family through the lens of food, traveling between uh, the United States and the Caribbean. I, I think I'm, I've got a couple of different uh, things that I'm uh, working on. It's been very difficult actually to write during during this time, but I, I, I do have a, a few things. I'm working on uh, a small collection of, I'm calling them bird songs right now, but they are um, uh, poems that uh, connect to a bird, some kind of bird that travels between the U.S and the Caribbean, so migratory birds. And um, so each poem is about a bird, but it sort of embodies the, you know, sort of life, black life. Um, and um, yeah, well, I'll just share that one. Oh, wonderful. Well, I, oh, one before... second. I forgot to mention that, um, because I find it fantastic that you can find books from Shauna, Benita, and I, and you'll soon hopefully be telling me all at Central Square Press. So if you go to centralsquarepress.com, you can find all of our suites of poems there. Faraday Publishing, which is um, the newest imprint, which is intended to embody um, a lot of the work that Central Square Press started with the chapbooks, except we're looking for a much bigger reach. Um, it is a nonprofit uh, organization, and you have a publishing body, but also a community activism body, uh, a mindfulness body, and so it's going to be something. Uh, I can't I can't say too much just just yet because things are still in the works. But we are going to go s an expansion of of the work we've already started, um, and I think it's fitting before we get to the Q and A. If you guys can read one final piece. Um, a closing piece to send the folks back into their, <laughs> you know, back into their own little space with some resonance. I, I can, uh, I can start. <laughs> um, and since I mentioned the the bird songs, I'll actually do uh, one of the poems from from that collection and. I um, I just want to say that yeah we didn't spend too much time talking about about love, um, but you know so many black poets talk about love as a sustaining, as a black artists in general right musicians what have you love as a sustaining force, and um, and so this this poem is a bird song but very much deals with um, black love. Black-throated songs for the black-throated blue warbler. The understory trembles, confessing the secret of her nest in woodbine, virgin ivy. She listens, flits her unremarkable self, offers up a moment, see, see, shrill to a buzz, he perches higher, bill up, see, see. A melody, skyward, cotton belly, black throat quivering, eminent plume turning blue as the mist burns away. See, see, she vibrates her wings, everything else falls away. Under a deciduous canopy, hovering together in after songs until the young are fledged, until the freedom of salt air until the sanctuary of moist ginger lily, until the oak and maple come again. 
There, a white spot on a wing below the viburnum berries bursting, a faithful warble of fruit. Thank you. What a gorgeous poem, Shauna. I'll, I'll, I'll read this one. It's from uh, My Old Man Was Always on the Lamb. It's called, I Was Born on a Saturday Night. My mother dropped me from her womb like a bad habit as if to regurgitate. I leave a bad taste in her mouth, leak out like a red drop on white cotton drawers, her first menses, stare warm water from her ear as if emerged from a swim or a shower. I lie in the maternity ward, a wet raisin soaked in blood and feces, high on heroin and Marlboro cigarettes, high on beer and wine and saturated foods, unable to scream, cry, or wince. My mother is nervous. She is freaking out, her womb pulling at her ribs like cobwebs. My mother can't take it, can't take me. She has to get up, get out. Stick a needle in her thigh. I am a dry prune, hairless in a bassinet. A purple blue dot in a pale green hospital room. My mother jumps up, covers her open wailing wound, refuses to look at me, writhing there like, a, like hairballs and dust on a wicker broom, puts on her coat over her gown, and with her yellow smiley face, disposable foam hospital slippers runs through the shitty snowy streets of the South Bronx off to get her Saturday night special. Okay, I have one. Um, when I'm watching a protest and I see a lot of young people and it really warms my heart to see that our young black women are out there fighting the struggle. And so I try to write some kind of light poem sometimes. And this one I wrote for, for the young black women out there in the protests. Secret elegance of flight. Cause we be allowed to be fine like this. Eyelashes glued and flutter like wings of an albatross. Cool our bodies as we walk the walk in the summer heat. We walk in formation in tight blue, ripped, shredded, skinny jeans, and our titties press tight as nipples sing, cause we pretty and pretty sings. We are bad. This what we got from Carolyn Rogers, Sonja Sanchez, bad truth saying sisters. That symbolic glitter of our magic that does not quietly fall to the ground. We sound more like hydrogen bombs, cause we loud and we pretty, and our eyelashes flutter like deaf ashes blows in the wind. We are here and everywhere, and here we will be. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, well, since I love that, um, Shauna flipped the black love switch. I mean, it was on the whole time, but I'm, I'm glad that you that you shone a light on it. So I want to also finish with a black love poem. Um, it's called After Dinner. This one goes out to Reuben Jackson. This is his favorite poem of mine. What is said in conversation when all the women leave the room? Satin glove slipped from fist, an uncut an uncut deck of cards. The men show their teeth, mark opinions like territory, laugh upside down, wrinkles shape-shifting between stone, wood, and flesh. This cut and paste debate sits in the shade of cigar smoke, sips dark liquors neat, no chaser, spans home front and auction block, Laughter and shit talk roll like distant thunder, make bridges of fragments, end in guarded embraces 
as quick as they are firm. Thank you so much, so much. I feel like, as I said, we could be here all night. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation. And I believe this is the beginning. Um, and hopefully we continue to have such conversations. Um, before we turn over to the Q&A, which will be next, um, I wanna close with a poem about black beauty. Since you guys turned on the black love switch, um, it's sort of, uh, it's a poem that was recently published um, back in July, um, the Academy of American Poets. Um, for the poem a day. And it's a question I, I kept asking myself um, as a father of two black sons, uh, seeing how beautiful they are, uh, wondering if the world sees them in that way and how long before they start to look less and less beautiful to the world. And so uh, it's really, it's, it's a poem of questions and it's a poem titled, When Night Fills With Premature Exits. Is there a place where black men can go to be beautiful? Is there light there, touch? Is there comfort or room to raise their black sons as anything other than a future asterisk? At risk to be asteroid or rogue planet, but not comet, to be studied with awe and clamor and admired for radio trajectories across a dark sky made of asphalt and moonshine, to be celebs and deemed a magnificent sight Thank you so much, folks. And now we invite uh, Michael Mercurio uh, with the Q&A section of, of the evening. Thank you, Enzo. And thank you to all of our panelists. It has been such a joy and such a gift to sit with you and to listen tonight. And our audience has had some excellent questions. Uh, we're only gonna have time for a few of them. So I am going to do a little prioritizing um, Isaiah Holloway asked, do you believe that black poetry would be recognizable as such if the author remained anonymous? That is to say, outside of the race of the author, what makes a poem black? It had to be one of my students, darn. <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question, but I claim to be able to tell without a shadow of a doubt if I'm talking to a black person on telephone. <laughs> Doesn't matter which voice they're using. I, I could, I can, uh, I don't know. There's something about the quality, the the, it's the timber of the voice. It's not even the subject matter. I'm, I'm half joking, but there is something in that. There's something about a depth of voice that, that I sense. I mean, this is a this this is a no, this is not a new question, right? This is a question that has been asked uh, by you know, uh, in this this question has been asked since uh, black people have been writing poetry in in the north in the U.S. America, right? Um, and I'll say that um, what is stunning, uh, I would you know, my answer to this question is that you know, just um, go out and read. I mean, it's such an impossible question to answer, you know, go out and read. You can't, I mean, the variety of black poetry in the US and on a global level, you know, is stunning and beautiful and utterly, utterly diverse. You know, it's formally aesthetic, it's aesthetically beautiful, it's formally innovative, it is raw, it is, you know, it's so many different things and so, I think I'm not answering the question, right, about race and uh, the distinctiveness, what makes a, a, a poem black, you know, uh, I think Amiri Baraka's poem, right, uh, Black Art uh, tells, tells us, uh, so I would send you there. <laughs> I think that's a good enough answer. We have another question from Christina Hamlet. I would love to learn more about their process. When do they know a piece is complete? When are they ready to let go? Boy, sometimes it's instant and then <laughs> you, could, you could have a poem written, you know, five, six, seven years. And then when it comes down to putting it into a book, it's another story. <laughs> so it takes on a different shape. So it, it all depends, you know, uh, 
because how you have it on the page can also be changed at the last minute. You know what I mean? So I don't know. It's it's a difficult question to ask. It's like a moment, a poem to poem type of uh, situation. I kind of agree with you. Sometimes it's immediately, sometimes it's not. And then also if you look inside a poet's book that's already been published, the poems have been changed after it's been published. So it's like, it's, it's never ending, it's never ending. As long as you get the gist of the idea in there, you know, and the feeling that you want to get across. But don't over don't over polish something to the point where it just disappears and you're paralyzed into not sharing it with the world. That's the problem that comes out of a lot of these MFA programs and stuff. You know, people yeah. leave yeah. programs so paralyzed and scared to put their work out there because they have all these people in their heads. That's not a good thing. Yeah. I think there's a delicate balance, um, as you kind of mentioned, between a piece is done for you in this moment that it captures where you are in this moment and not worry about what it's gonna look like two or three years down the line because you're going to change. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the poem has to change is this is where I was at the time, right? And then other times it's like, no, I really need to revisit this particular piece. Um, but you're right, there's this pressure, you know, from outside forces to say no it's not done until you do this you got to jump ropes you got to do many different things but I agree it's capture the moment and if it it'll call you back the poem always calls you back for revision if it doesn't let it be leave it alone <laughs> yeah. absolutely you know I respect the recursiveness of, of of writing you know it's once I put it on the page and I read it again you know I always go back to it um, and then it and it tells me you know, when it's, when it needs to be laid down. I, I remember in the recent Jill Scott and Erica Badu sister love fest that was supposed to be a battle, but it was really just a beautiful family moment. I remember her saying that she had for so long, she had so many poems that were sitting in notebooks and she kind of got this message. She received this message that told her that you received these poems and they were seeds that were supposed to make their way into the world. So if you are keeping them in your notebook, you are not completing the task that was meant for the poem when it was gifted to you. And I thought that was, that was such a beautiful meditation on the idea, right? That, that the whole reason why the poem is coming through you in the first place is not just to stay with you. So at a certain point, as Shauna said, you just have to let go. And maybe maybe you don't ever feel, I think Benita's right, maybe you never feel like it's done. And you read the book that's already been published and you're constantly still tweaking that poem. But there's a difference between maybe being done and just letting go. At a certain point, you just have to let it go out into the world and trust, as Tony said, that you have put enough of the intention into it, that the message, which is the ultimate thing that you want to land, comes through, even if all of the technical perfections are not in place. I think that was a, a beautiful series of answers from all of you. And it brings us right to nine o'clock. Um, again, I want to thank all of our extraordinary poets for sharing so much of themselves with us tonight. And to our audience for joining us on this extraordinary evening. It's a real testament to the power of poetry to build and sustain community that we have these poets coming to us from far-flung corners of this hemisphere to join together and share their words with us. So again, thank you poets, thank you audience. Uh, for our audience, we hope you have the chance to check out more of the Tell It Slant Poetry Festival. The schedule is easily found on our website. Uh, you can sign up for additional events Tomorrow evening, we will have our festival open mic, and that is followed by a reading by headliner Franny Choi. So please don't miss that, and definitely don't miss Jericho Brown and Ada Limon with music by Kimia Diggs on Saturday night as our headliners. Uh, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bonita. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Enzo. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. 
And thank you so much. Appreciate it. This has been amazing. Thanks. Thank you so much, everybody. Had a blast. Be well. Thank Good night. You. Bye. Good night. Good night.